Hi, this is Shadi and today I'm gonna be discussing one of the most underrated uh, pioneers of Judo, someone who really helped to spread out Judo at the turn of the century and also someone that has had a relatively hard life from as a child from family customs and traditions up until his untimely death and that man is Gunji Koizumi. Gunji Koizumi is regarded as the father of British Judo and also uh, he founded the Budo Kuei, a pioneering martial arts society in England. He also helped uh, found the British Judo Association and also founded the European Judo uh, Union. He was a master of both Tenshin Shinryu Jujutsu and Kodokan Judo. So he is a man that has accomplished so much and for someone that has accomplished so much, he had a relatively sad life, in my opinion, and we will talk about this. So, uh, Koizumi was born on July 8, 1885, in the village of Komatsuka, Owaza, in Ibaraki Prefecture of Japan, and he was the younger son, or like the middle child, of a farmer, and he had an older brother and a younger sister, so he was the middle child, and at the age of 12, he started training kendo and also his neighbor uh, started to teach him English, which is, you know, by today's standards, is, this is something very normal, but back then a closed off Japan and also uh, no internet. A lot of us learned in English through uh, watching TV shows and listening to music. They had none of that and he had probably never seen a Latin a syllable or a letter in his life and still he went on and learned English just at the age of 12 and you know we have Japanese people till this day that you know, very barely speak any English uh, very similar to Kano sensei when he was in college and taking his notes in English rather than in kanji or uh, writing in Japanese so this is something that's actually very admirable uh, we should look at it very seriously when it comes to uh, who was Koizumi. So, as he was not the eldest son, he had two options back then at his time: either go on start his own business, go uh, and you know go f look for a job, or become uh, an adopted male heir to another family in order to uh, how do you say inherit what uh, what the father had? Because back then, only the eldest son would inherit everything, and all the rest are just you know screwed so if you were for example a daughter uh, you would go out and get married and you would go into the house of your husband but if you are not the eldest son this is where you are truly screwed you would have to go look for your own job and start your own from scratch and the eldest son would inherit everything from his father so the farm of his father would go to his uh, elder oldest brother and this is why he disliked this and uh, in 1900, uh, he uh, turned 15, he left home to seek uh, a future and a job and a life in Tokyo. And this is where he started to learn how to be a telegrapher under the uh, government. So in 1901, just a year later, he started training Jiu-Jitsu under Tago Nabushige. It was the Tenshin Shinryu Jiu-Jitsu, very uh, similar to Kano Sensei. So he qualified to become a telegrapher and worked uh, in Tokyo and also uh, went on to Korea before and worked as a railway uh, worker in Korea. So in 1904 he trained under Yamada uh, Nobukatsu uh, which was a samurai or a former samurai because it was the turn of the century and the class of the samurai was abolished. So uh, Koizumi decided to he wanted to study electricity and he wanted to go to the West in order to make that dream come true. So he traveled uh, in the East through Shanghai, uh, India, Singapore, Hong Kong, and working also wherever he went. And in 1905 in Singapore, he trained under uh, Tsunejiro Akishima. So uh, in 1906, on May 4th, he arrived in North Wales in the United Kingdom and there he traveled to Liverpool and uh, this is where he took a, a post of a Jiu Jitsu instructor in the school of Kara Ashikaga 
and then he traveled to the south of London where he uh, collaborated with uh, Sadakazu Uyenishi in the Bartitsu school. I covered Sadakazu very recently and uh, I will link the video at the end. And he was also uh, Sadakazu operating his own school that which I mentioned of course in Piccadilly Circus and during this time he taught Jiu Jitsu, uh, Koizumi I'm talking, in the London Polytechnique which is a very high level school and also at the Royal Navy uh, he taught Jiu Jitsu and after a few months he set off to New York and he arrived in 1907 in order to work in the railway company after a few years he wasn't happy with his job anymore so he returned to England and there he started an electric lighting company uh, but it did not have enough funds and also uh, being an Eastern man it did not work in his favor so in 1912 he set up uh, he lived in London and had his own uh, house so in 1918 six years later he funded his own project to establish the London society a martial arts society called the Budo Kuei a way of knighthood because you know if you know something or two about England being a knight is something very honorable so he called it the Budo Kuei uh, the way of knighthood society and the Budo Kuei offered uh, free classes of Jiu Jitsu, Kendo and other martial arts to the British people and he secured a location in Lower Grosvenor Place uh, and, which was very close to the Buckingham Palace so he was teaching probably one of the best people in the London society uh, and he opened finally the Budo Kuei in on January 26th in 1918 so in 1919 uh, he helped establish the Kyuzai Kai, a society which uh, helped people to get medical uh, help and also employment and housing assistance for the Japanese because the Japanese people back then were still on the diaspora. It was very hard for them to go and settle in the West. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going on in Japan. You had the Reformation trying to make uh, Japan into an industrial country after being closed off for centuries so it was very hard for the Japanese people to go and trying to adapt kind of like what uh, Mitsuya Maeda did for the Japanese but in Brazil so uh, he uh, served as a general secretary at the Budo Kuei and also uh, he would stay there all day and also help the Japanese people so in 1920 he met Jigoro Kano himself, the founder of the Kodokan, while he was on his way to the Olympic Games. And after like a lot of meetings and discussions, uh, he and Yukio Tani, which was another Jiu-Jitsu master that I covered in a video of his own and shared his book uh, as the PDF, uh, they became uh, Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, official judokas. They changed to the judo system, and Kano immediately awarded them the second Dan certification. So they were uh, acknowledged judokas by Kano himself after he went to Europe to see the Olympic Games. So in 1922, uh, I'm sorry, throughout World War II, uh, the Budo Kuei kept the training judo, but it was at the expense of Koizumi himself because keep in mind, uh, Japan did not have the greatest uh, reputation back then and also it was looked down upon everything that has to do with them including judo so uh, he had a tough time teaching people and also keeping the Budo Kuei the society open and also funding everything uh, himself so uh, it was very hard for him to keep it all together however he kept on doing it uh, so in 1947 he organized with his friend another uh, judo master Mikunsuke Kawaishi which I talked about and constantly mention on this channel uh, they they hosted the first ever recorded judo international tournament some outside of Japan between two countries the UK and France so it was UK and France because Koizumi was teaching in UK and Kawaishi was teaching in France so they hosted this tournament where they had their student students 
face each other and it was called the Kaweshi Cup and in 1948 uh, Koizumi was uh, promoted to 6th Dan and he helped establish the British Asso Judo Association in the same year 1948 uh, he, he served as president and by the end of the 1940s he uh, retired from everything that had to do with business and keeping you know being president and secretary all that stuff and he solely focused on being a judo teacher and in 1951 three years later he became seventh dan judo he got married uh, he had a daughter and his daughter later married a, a renowned uh, western judoka by the name of Percy Sikine. Uh, he was actually one of his uh, uh, Koizumi's students. So, towards the end of his life, uh, this is where uh, I have mixed feelings about his untimely death because it is truly sad going through all of this and having such a tragic ending. Uh, so, on September 1954, the uh, Budokwe moved to a larger uh, zone and after being 50 years almost in the west he returned shortly to Japan and uh, the Kodokan president Risei Kano the son of Jigoro Kano and his family uh, welcomed him uh, at the airport and he was treated as an honored guest uh, so this is where he decided to come back so it was a very short stay he decided to come back to the UK and he wrote uh, some books on judo for example uh, judo the basic technical principles and exercises supplemented with contest rules and grading syllabus which was uh, published in 1958 and also my study of judo principles and technical fundamentals just two years after in 1960 and he continued to teach uh, a judo till the end of his life in the mid 1960s so uh, this is where it gets very tragic uh, the night before he died uh, Charles Palmer uh, his student actually sensed that his sensei was not 100% uh, he was not well uh, he said uh, in an interview that instead of you know he was constantly smiling he said he would always smile and say good night see you tomorrow etc so he shook his hand and instead of saying good night he shook his hand uh, he wasn't smiling and he said goodbye uh, so on April 15th 1965 uh, he apparently uh, took his own life and um, he was found wearing his favorite suit seated in his uh, on his uh, big and favorite chair uh, in his home and uh, he had a plastic bag over his head uh, so the way he took his own life was very violent and also just very graphic just trying to imagine it kind of like when you hear about uh, Anthony Bourdain or uh, Chester of Linkin Park the way they did it is just way too violent and nobody predicted it and it's just just the thought of it is just extremely disturbing and just reading it was just not easy for me so a lot of people obviously it shocked the judo community and uh, a lot of people started saying this was dishonorable uh, obviously some of the Japanese while some others said that this was very much like an honorable death, like the um, seppuku or harakiri, the uh, the momo, uh, how do you say, the ceremonial uh, practice where you take your own life if you lost the battle, uh, and you know you don't want to live with this uh, loss. And a lot of conflicting accounts say that he was promoted to eighth dan. Uh, shortly before his death or eighth done shortly after his death but that doesn't matter uh, the, the man was eighth done that's all that matters uh, you know for someone that has overcome so much uh, the war 
uh, you know, family traditions that were that worked against him. Uh, it's uh, going to the West, learning English at that time, going be, uh, from you know being a son of a farmer and going out and overcoming so much. By the way, he did this at the age of 79. In 1965, he was 79 years old, uh, just four months before his, seven, his 80th birthday. So he was born in 85 and he passed away in 65. So at, towards the end of your life and still doing this, you know, you already lived a long and fulfilling life. Like, why would you do this? And this is something that uh, concerns me. Uh, I greatly and personally because I personally believe that these arts not only you know provide you with like a peace of mind but also they enrich your quality of life so much so that you want to live it all throughout up until the end uh, doing this kind of thing especially like wearing his best suit uh, in his favorite chair so he like he obviously shaved uh, his face, he wore his clothes. Uh, just it did, like just saying, he wore his best suit and seated in his uh, chair where he uh, welcomed guests, etc. It just seems that he he took his time and prepared for it. Very similar to like a harakiri or like a the seppuku, and he just did this and. The way he did it, like the plastic back thing, it just showed that he had so much demons. I don't know about his personal life, but for someone to accomplish all these things, and it's not like uh, like being a Hollywood movie star or like a rock star and you know being famous, but you know a shallow type of famous. He he was famous for the right reasons. He spread judo. He uh, funded his own club and he paid uh, the expenses of his students he wrote two books and still he carried out and did this it's just it's so i don't know what to say honestly because from what i can see judo can obviously can save your life and here i don't know what was going on in his life maybe he was welcomed by his family as an honored guest by the kodokan so he wasn't like uh, an outcast or a social pariah whatsoever. He he was a great man, and still he went out and did this. I'm I'm sorry, like I'm repeating myself, or I'm like I'm almost like ranting, or like I'm outraged. But why would he do this? Like there's no reason. Uh, one would end his life if either say he lost his family, his family either disowned him or they passed away. Or he lo he lo he, like he has nothing as from economics. He lost his home, etc. Or it's someone that he had no uh, will to live. Like he had no dreams. He couldn't see the concept of tomorrow, and that's why he just ended it. Or he d he didn't have disabilities. Nothing. I would. I'm just so like shocked at the way like he ended his like after. Everything he did and just ending like this is just so. <sighs> I don't know what to say. I, I, this, it's important to discuss these things because, yeah, uh, judo gave him a career. It gave him a life. It gave him an opportunity to go to the West and cement his name and legacy forever, basically. And in my opinion, that's a great reason to live out your life to the end and I don't know what's going on in his personal life but judo what should have been able to at least live the few years he had left in peace rather than to go out like this or maybe someone did it and it wasn't himself I don't know but there's no evidence if there was evidence you know it would show uh, I don't know Tell me what you think down below. I'm sorry for this very long rant because this is something uh, important, at least for me, because judo is not just competitions and medals and technique and whatever. It's really about making your life a better existence and making society a better place, not to end your life in this just tragic manner. Uh, 
please, if you have anything else to add, you know, it's wide open. Uh, this was Shadi, and thank you for listening. <laughs>